Sometimes, after you have heard the word of God, or you read some scripture, or you have even preached it yourself, the word keeps on going in your heart. It wouldn't let you stop that chapter and move on to something else. All through the week, the word of God kept coming back and coming back as if it's an unfinished business. Before I go into the word, it's a pleasure, great honor to be here once again. And I'm trusting God that I'll be able to deliver what he has given to me. And I'm praying that my voice and your ears will be anointed to receive, to receive that portion that is yours. The same goes for those who are joining us online. Welcome and God bless you. Last Sunday, we were talking about wealth creation and living in abundance, living the abundant life. As I mentioned a moment ago, I went home and that word did not leave me. It's as if there is still something. Let me just touch on it very, very quickly in obedience. I found myself reading about the prodigal son. And when you look at it, the prodigal son is not a very natural story that will come when you're talking about abundant life and world creation. But as I kept trading, something struck me, and that was the first thing with the guy we commonly call the prodigal son. The prodigal son went to his father. I don't want to use he, him, he, he, and it gets confusing. So let's call his father Abba. The second son of Abba went to Abba and said, give me everything that falls to me. I thought that Abba will go in and find the account that belongs to the second son and give it to him, find the motorcycle that is the son's and give it to him. No. Abba went in and the scripture says he divided his entire livelihood. That is Abba's own livelihood, not the son's. Why didn't Abba tell the son, you are asking too much. You are asking for what does not belong to you. So that was kind of surprising to me. So in a way, the son's request was not challenged by the father. It must have been a legitimate request because Ab uh, Abba went in and gave him half everything that Abba owned. So why didn't he give him everything? There were two sons, you remember? If that prodigal son had been the only son, the father would have given that prodigal son everything that Abba owned. Another shocking revelation in that passage, the second son, I mean the older son, came into the picture. He was throwing his own tantrum. I've been a good boy. I've never disobeyed you. I've lived here all along. You haven't even killed a young goat for me. I'm not making this up, brethren. I'm just trying to paraphrase it and get to the new message. He said, you haven't even killed a young goat for me. But when the prodigal son came back, what did Abba kill for him? The scripture says is the fatted calf. There must, be, there must have been a calf that is a young cow that was fattened, ready for special locations. Abba himself, the servant, everybody was referring to this calf as the fatted calf, a particular calf that was ready for special locations. Abba told the first son, the older son, listen, Everything I have is yours. Translation, if you wanted to eat a fatted calf, you should just have told one of the servants and they go and prepare it for you. I can imagine a roasted cow. 
That's a lot of meat there. The next thing he told him, plain black and white, don't you know that everything I have belongs to you? Please read that scripture. You will see that I'm not adding anything or taking out anything. Conclusion of the matter. A parable is an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. Many things that Jesus told in parables, people could relate to them, but there was a deeper spiritual meaning. And what struck me there like really, really, really at work, at work, was that indeed that Abba in that story is our Heavenly Father. And our Heavenly Father is telling us in that passage, don't you know, it's in Luke chapter 15, by the way, don't you know that everything I own, that's Abba Father now talking, don't you know that everything that I own, you have access to it as a son? Many times we talk about sons of God. And to be politically correct, many people add sons and daughters of God. I searched in the word of God, I didn't see any daughters of God. I saw daughters of men, daughters of this, daughters of that, but in all places referring to a relationship with God, God himself is adopting us onto a relationship of father and son. I'm not trying to bypass the ladies. Even as a lady, your entitlement by covenant promise is the inheritance of a son. Last point on this. Jesus introduced himself as the son of God. All the Sadducees and Pharisees went berserk. They understood what he was saying when he referred to himself as the son of God. They thought he was blaspheming. By that reference, they thought he was making himself equal to God without right. A son, by laws of inheritance, the way God sees it, a son is actually a copy of the father. I can see somebody's son going home today and say, Dad, that luxurious car you just bought, the pastor and the preacher that was saying, everything you own is mine. Yeah. Can I take that thing for a ride? I'm sure the fathers know how to deal with that. Yeah. But I just want to tell you that our inheritance as children of God, sons of God, includes everything that heaven has. That is why the first son got it wrong. The first son was expecting that the father should have killed a young goat for him. The, the dad says, no, you are getting it wrong. Praise the Lord. This morning, I'm going to touch very quickly on practical steps to financial freedom. And I want to leave this image in your head so that everywhere you see steps, whether it is steps to the pulpit here, steps to your basement, step to upstairs. I want you to think steps to financial freedom. Give me a slide, please. First thing, first step. Many people, especially at the beginning of the year like this, make financial, I mean, they make their resolutions. I have been working 5,000 steps every day. I'm going to increase it to 10,000 steps every day. Maybe somebody here is doing that. Some of us only walk to the mailbox and back. Some people have resolved. <clears throat> Some people say we are going to cut off soda and cut off processed food. Can anybody identify with that? Let me ask you this. In your New Year resolutions this year, let's just start with now, does it in any way include financial goals? 
are you making a decision to increase your steps to 10,000 a day, but as far as financial issues are concerned, you have absolutely no plans, no expectations, and no goal. First step to financial freedom is recognizing the importance and relevance of it and saying, this year, by the grace of God, I am going to increase my savings. I am going to add more to my investment account. I am going to strive more for that goal or the other goal. It must be measurable so that midway, you will evaluate yourself in the goals that you have set. Are you working towards it or are you in the same place where you were last year? Last week, I revealed something that I watched uh, uh, WrestleMania. I mean, the whole thing, tables, ladders, and chairs. And somebody must have said, what kind of guy is this? Let me reveal another thing. I like to go to the range and do target practice. Do you mean with a gun? Yes, with a gun. And you say you're a Christian? Yes, by the grace of God. Now, what if you went to the range and started shooting, but you have no target in front of you? You will never know whether you hit it or not, right? Because there's nothing there. But when you hit bull's eye at 25 yards, you move it further to 50 yards, hit bull's eye again, you move it 100 yards. Before you know it, you will be hitting bull's eye at 200 yards. But without a goal, without a target, without any expectation, you will not even know whether you're shooting at anything or not. It's a very dangerous place to be, especially if you desire to be financially independent and financially free. Let me ask you this. How has your graph been in the last five years? I mean financial graph. There's something we used to say many years ago, as it was in the beginning. So it is now, and so it will be forever. That does not apply to your financial position or status. There should be a progress made, even if it's a little at a time. I'm going to move on to something else, but let me say this on behalf of the woman. Please, don't give your uh, special one uh, that evil eye. And don't give him the elbow on the rib cage when I say this. <laughs> Women, our ladies, our loved ones, I'm speaking as a man now, our ladies are expecting financial leadership. Amen. Oh, we say we are the head of everything. But can you provide for your family financial direction? If somebody comes to you and say, honey or sweetie or whatever they call you when they have a special request to make, <laughs> honey, what are we doing about this? And you say, I don't know. But on the other hand, if as the head of the family, you're able to provide financial guidance, you say, honey, this is what we are going to do. This, after that, this, and then the next one and that, you become a hero because you are able to provide financial guidance to your family. But if you don't know which way is the up or down, somebody was giving me direction. He says, turn north. I says, I have no way of knowing where north is. Tell me to turn left or tell. I don't know, without a compass, how do I know which is not? Now, what I'm saying is this. If you don't have a financial compass where you're going to, how will you get there? Am I making sense? Yes. By the way, I should give you a disclosure. Yours truly, I'm not a financial professional. I have no degree in finance. I'm not giving you financial advice. I don't, it's beyond my pay scale. And what I'm talking about today is 
practical things that you need to do. How do I know I've done every one of them and I can recommend them as a, an effective strategy? Let's move on to the next step. The next step I have called invest. Invest and then invest some more. Hmm. In the book Matthew 25, next slide please. In Matthew 25, verse 1 begins with, the kingdom of God is like this. Matthew 25, that's in verse 1. The kingdom of God can be likened to this. There were some parables that followed that verse 1. The first one following this verse was the ten virgins. I will touch on it very briefly. But if you go to verse 14, it talks about something very familiar. Everybody knows about the guys that their master gave some talents. I'm moving fast, but these are familiar grounds. I, I don't believe anybody is lost behind. It says in verse 14 that the master gave one guy $5,000 equivalent. He gave to the other guy 2,000. Let me test and make sure you are not sleeping. How much did he give the third guy? 1,000, great, excellent. He never gave them the same amount. God will not dump on your laps $1 million when you are only capable of handling 100. There are people you give a $1,000 today they do something crazy to themselves. Just because they are not used to that, God give, gave them a certain amount according to their ability. So the amount can be different. Next point. God, their master, did not give them a, a, a weekly stipend. Every week, come and take $200 and spend on what you need. He gave them a certain amount to do what with it, occupy till I come. Translation, use this capital, invest it, do something with it. When I come back, I will see what you have done. Third point, he never limited them to any one single thing. God wants us to use our creative ability. Use your imagination. Extend your territory. Explore. Last week, I was talking about God making us to be, to be in charge, to have dominion over, to be creative. God wants us to chase, catch up with it, and overcome that whatever it is. So God did not tell them, go flip homes, or go put on stock market, or go do something. He simply told them, occupy, get busy, till I come. The first two guys, one with 5,000, one with 2,000, the scripture says they went at once. They went immediately and got busy. Don't let Warren Buffett hear you say that. I like playing with the stock markets. Many times, I get calls and people tell me, oh, brody, I'm going to do this thing. One of these days, I say, yes, great, amen. <laughs> Six months later, they'll tell me, listen, I have not forgotten that thing. I'm going to do it one day. Then one year later, you meet that person again. He tells you, seriously, some time to come, when Jupiter and Mars line up together, I am definitely going to do this. These two guys, 5,000, 2,000, what did they do? They went at once. And there was a third man. I read the scripture. I like to read scripture line by line, even in between the lines. There was no mention of at once. He must have taken his time and later on, I don't know exactly how long after, he found a broken shovel in the back shed and dug a hole and put the 1,000 there and grumbled, 
how there was inequality in the society, how the white folks are making more than the black folks, how even with this, and he just went on in his basement, and we didn't hear about him anymore until the master came back. I want to really tell you the truth. I'm not saying this just to butter him up. I like the, the pastor. He is very, very eager to move. He is an active guy. Listen, uh, you know, uh, I'm 67 years old. Now, don't tell people things just so, you know, they will like me or anything. But last week, the pastor was gracious enough to share with us the re returns he had on his investment. And I know that in many places, members of a congregation strive to be like their pastor. That's a good recommendation. And that was what those two groups of people did. They came back to the master and they said, Master, you gave us five talents. We brought five more. And in my mathematics, that's a 100% return. The 2,000 guy brought how much? A 100% return. Both of them, even though the amount they were playing with was different, they got the same commendation. I know it by heart because when I'm investing, that's the return I'm expecting. Well done, thou good and faithful servant. You have been faithful in the little that I gave you. I'm going to give you some more. Let me ask you this. Why do these rich guys that keep investing and making more and more, why do they keep getting richer and richer every day? Have you wondered why is it that somebody that is already a billionaire is still investing in new companies, buying new things, in exploring, and just being? There is a secret that if you and I pick it up, you will see a change. Invest, invest, invest. And you say, I don't know how. This is a true story. When we were younger, my dad was really serious, you know, ex-military. It was a no-nonsense guy. If he were challenging you, he would ask you, do people doing so, 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 do they have two heads? I'm sure your parents asked you that as well. And as little children, you'll be struggling not to laugh. How do people even look like when they have two heads? Will the two faces be facing the same way, or can one head look the other way, and you're bending down trying to hold the laughter? If your dad laughed when my dad was telling you about people not having two heads, you might end up with two heads yourself. <laughs> so what I'm saying, my brethren, if you don't know how, the people that are doing it, even from a high school age, do they have two heads? If you set your mind to it, there is nothing that you cannot learn. I am so confident about this that if you wanted to know how to trade, you will be able to learn it. It is really less complicated than rocket science. When I talk, I show you some things, just to encourage you. I'm not trying to show off or be, you know. Uh, I have a slide there that shows my returns. And why I'm showing this, I have a 401k. I'm going to that in a minute. And the guys were giving me a ridiculously insulting returns, one point something percent. You know why? They are using my money to live at the 36th floor yes. of a Los Angeles skyscraper. Yes. And at the end, unapologetically, they give me one and a half percent for a year. But I'm very smart. I looked at that and said, no way on earth can this be what you're making with my money. I called them and said, Give me control of that account. I want to manage it myself. If you can find that graph, it is, uh, yes, excellent. There are four bars there. The first bar is the returns in one year 
of yours truly managing my own 401k. 124% return in 124 last year. And this is the 401k account where I trade modestly. It's my retirement account. I'm not aggressive on this account. The account where I am aggressive on, 180% return. What were they giving me before? 1.6725%. I said, no, thank you. There is nobody that can look after your interest more than you, yourself. If you don't know what to do, bury that money with your 401k trading company, and when the master comes back, you give him back the 1,000 you put in, and most of that 1,000 is money you contributed every pay period, and that will be it. Amen. Amen. I am going on. Many of us have perfected this skill of working for somebody. Growing up again, they told us, if you want to be sure of a meal ticket, you have to study and study and study and pass everything. Of those under the sound of my voice, now, right now, if we did a survey, I am sure you will find somebody with an MD, a PhD, and an MBA. You might even find somebody with two PhDs. We are used to reading and reading until we pass where the money is, and we are still reading. Every single degree, I am not knocking it. I have them all myself. Masters, PhD. I even saw a course, they were asking for people to register in the police academy. Yours truly, I registered, and I graduated from the Lawrenceville Police Academy. If you want me to read, show me something to read. I will register and read it. I am a citizen police officer, as I'm talking to you. Why do I need that? Never a day am I going to work as a police officer. But I like reading, reading, reading. But in addition to reading, and reading is very good, yes. learn how to create wealth. If the PhD doesn't work, you pull out another degree. On that subject, let me tell you this. We also perfect writing application. I humbly request, I truly, honestly, will serve you like uh, nobody has a, I will do whatever you want me to do. At a point, even with a PhD, I apply for top jobs. They said, no, your experience was in England. I apply for a low job. They said, no, you are too qualified. I apply for this. They said, no, your experience is not in US. We keep applying, applying. Give me even an entry level job. You know, there are some folks that we see you doing those nine to five jobs and they laugh at you. I'm not telling you not to do a nine to five job. I have one. Everything I'm telling you this morning, I have gone through it and tested it. If you are going to work anyhow, you need to maximize your 401k. I'm going to be quick on this. Many employers will give you a 401k retirement plan. Anybody? Some of them are even generous. Whatever you contribute, we will match it. Do you know how many of our folks leave money on the table and walk away? If your employer is giving you a matching of 6%, sacrifice your salary and put in that 6%, and your employer will give you free money in addition to your salary. But many people don't even have a 401k. They are not contributing to it, even though their employer has a program for that. They say, the money is so small. If I contribute 3%, it will finish. Yes, the money will finish, if you contribute 3%, it will also finish. But at least you will know where it finished. Later on, 
you can pull that money out. Let me see if I can put this in very quickly. In that same Matthew, where we talked about the prodigal son, the first parable was about the ten virgins. All of them were virgins to start with. All of them had their lambs with oil in it. But some of them, five of them were called foolish. Again, the Bible doesn't use political or correct language. If you are doing foolish things, you're foolish. I'm not saying that of anybody here. I'm just telling you what is in the scripture. Why were they foolish? They had oil in their lamp, and as you light that lamp, it will be burning and using up that oil, correct? They all had an account where they are spending every day, uh, car notes, electricity bill, everything, everything, and as you keep burning that candle, that oil will finish. Those of them that were called wise had something different. They had oil in their lamp as well, where they were spending every day, every day, every day. But they also had a spare bottle where they put away some oil for the rainy day. Oh, my God. You want to be wise? You must have a certain reserve somewhere for the rainy day. And the rainy day will come. And the foolish ones went back to the wise ones and said, you know that thing you have been serving a little at a time? Can you give us some of it? And those ladies were really wise. They said, if we give you this, both of us will run out of oil. I've been in America and many times I've done things where I need to see people's income and their credit and their financial reserve. Do you know that many people in this greatest country on God's planet do not have spare $500 in the event of an emergency? Many years ago, I used to sell cars. If they must put down $500, they'll give you a check to hold until the next payday. That is reckless living, right? There are many people today, if something unexpected happened, they will need to put $400 on a credit card till the payday. Financial freedom involves your making plans, not just with the oil in the, in the lamp right now, but having oil that can last you if something crazy happens for four months, six months, one year. Financial freedom. I can only touch on this for one second. Sometime, especially for the young ones, one bank is going to give you your first credit card. It's usually $500 or something small. Please, I'm begging you, in the name of our Lord and Savior, <laughs> do not max up that card to 480. The damage you can do to your first credit card can stay with you for years after your, you have grown beers. And do you know that some of those cars will tell you, you don't even have to pay anything more than $10 minimum this thing. And then you go shopping and max the card up. Do you know what they will charge you at the end? 25%. Your investment is giving you a return of 1%, but your credit card is charging you 25%. If it is at all possible, don't put anything on a credit card that you cannot pay off in full at the end of the month. You should use it. America is not a cash society. You must be seen to be able to use credit and manage it well. You need that credit card. Put gas on it if you are going to buy $20 card, car, gas. When that bill comes, pay it off even before the due date. Put again, $30 card, what am I saying? Gas. There are many things to share. But let the Spirit of God expound this message to you. We need to be financially strong. 
that will be stable and financial strength is essential for a very stable home. I'm not done with this, but this is enough. Just do one of these many things and you will see some growth this year. God bless you.